Good morning. Welcome to PRG Webinar 057, SIF Development for Pipe Shoes, Saddles, and Other Supports. This webinar is pre presented by Pollen Research Group, and my name is Tony Pollen. Please send comments regarding this presentation to webinar at pollen.com. Discussions or disagreements of general interest will be posted at www.pollen.com backslash webinar. To get electronic copies of these slides and a one-hour PDH certificate, please send an email to webinarpollen.com and request a copy of the slides and your certificate, and an electronic copy will be forwarded to you. This webinar system only exists if uh, people attend, so please email a colleague that you think might be interested and ask them to join us. The question we'd like to ask this morning is why or when should I worry about stress intensification factors or SIFs at pipe supports? We may be thinking I've never worried about them before. Why do I have to worry about them now? Well, there are several reasons or, or possibilities for why this uh, may be an issue. Number one is when fatigue is present. In fact, that's probably the, 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 the major reason why we would worry about stress intensification factors at pipe supports is because we had a heavily cyclic system. And this can be systems that cycle due to pressure, temperature, or other cyclic external loads. Usually stress in the pipe is controlled by stress intensification factors at bends or intersections and not SIFs at pipe supports. So if there are high thermal loads at pipe supports, care should be exercised, and we may need to focus on stress intensification factors at pipe supports where we didn't before. As another characteristic of that system, you may be dealing with a poor design if you have high thermal loads at your pipe supports and no bends or uh, intersections around to control the stress intensification factors. So those are just characteristics that, that we should look for when we're worried about SIFs at pipe supports. Principally, we don't have bends or intersections controlling for some reason, so there's a little bit of a geometry uh, change, and we have high loads, or, or what tend to be high thermal loads at these pipe supports, or really high any type of load that causes uh, or that's, uh, that's cyclic in nature. Another reason uh, or occasion where we might be worried about SIFs at pipe supports is where we have a proto prototype scale up from a small model to a large model so that we don't have any experience with the system. In these cases, extra care should be exercised with all facets of the design. Another case is where we have heavily corrosive and heavily cyclic service. In these cases, uh, extra caution should also be exercised for all parts that are susceptible to fatigue, not just at pipe supports. What do the B31 codes say about support design? B311 emphasizes that consideration shall be given to localized stresses induced into the piping component by the integral attachments. B313 echoes this, adding that undue flattening of the pipe support should be considered, again uh, echoing the excessive local bending stress uh, caution, also adding a, uh, a discussion about harmful thermal gradients, and in particularly in cyclic service. B313 and 321.4 also adds that the load from piping and pipe supporting elements shall be suitably transmitted to a pressure vessel, to a support structure, or to another pipe capable of bearing the load without deleterious effects, letting us decide what is deleterious. And to some extent, that's what we're about today. So there's going to be three ways that we look at to develop SIFs for supports or to do some sort of analysis for supports. So this discussion will apply for developing stress intensification factors and for just doing analysis of supports. There'll be a simple way that we look at where we just try to recognize the fact that the weldment quality and orientation in the support itself is different from the weld orientation in a straight pipe and that that alone will produce a stress intensification factor effect. The next uh, level will be the base case where we attempt to simulate a SIF test using finite elements or uh, a theoretical uh, test on a support component. Next, we'll talk about doing a comprehensive analysis where we recognize that uh, a more complicated evaluation is needed, and we want to know what, comp or what constitutes a more complicated evaluation requirement. The, 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 few cautions, or the two cautions that I would like to issue now are that 
we want to supplement existing standards and experience with analysis. We don't want to replace existing standards and experience with analysis. Somewhere in, in everybody's company, there should be a pipe support table. We should never try to uh, go beyond the pipe support tables unless we pay very careful attention to what we're doing. We, we don't take these methods and throw the pipe support table right out the window. Secondly is that this is not a webinar on how to design pipe supports. What this is is, is a webinar that the pipe stress engineer can use to help his uh, pipe support designer to make his job quite a bit easier. At least that's the hope. So let's talk about the simple method where we want to recognize that the weldment quality and support plate orientation for the support has an effect on the fatigue strength of the pipe. In this figure, what you see is the girth bolt weld and the typical support weldment. If the weldment of this support plate onto the pipe causes a fatigue failure before the girth bolt weld would fatigue fail, then the stress intensification factor is greater than one. And that's what we want to consider by the simple evaluation. The way we're going to do that is go to the International Institute of Welding, although there are many sources for this type of plot. This is called, uh, among other things, the cartoon method, where we find a cartoon of the geometry that we want to evaluate. And then the cartoon gives us what's called a fat, the, uh, the fatigue uh, curve that's going to be used. We find the fat in the reference diagram for the code. This is from the IIW International Institute of Welding. The title of this document is The Fatigue Design of Welded Joints and Components. So we find the necessary fat curve, and that gives us the alternating stress versus number of cycle, the allowed life for our component, subject to the loading described in the cartoon. The first thing we want to do is we'd like to find the fat or the fatigue curve that we want to use for our girth bolt weld, because that's what we're going to use as a reference. So I'm going to use figure 212 for the girth bolt weld, and that gives me a fat of 100. Now what the fat class is, is the fatigue allowable stress range in MPA at 2 million cycles. So clearly what I'm going to be able to do, <coughs> or hopefully what I'm going to be able to do, is compare the fat from our component to the fat for a girth bow weld, and that will give me the stress intensification factor for the support using the simple method. So here is the typical pipe that's uh, a part of our uh, uh, pipe support. The M over Z from our pipe produces this load in the diagram. So here's the bending moment that we calculate from the pipe stress program. This is the M over Z stress that's developed from that bending moment. Here is the fat that's to be used with this load on this plate and this weldment. The fat, as you see, is a function of the tau over sigma ratio. So take a look at what that is. The tau over sigma ratio is the ratio of the shear stress to the nominal stress. So if the shear stress to the nominal stress is zero, our, our stress intensification factor is going to be 100, which is the fat for the girth bolt weld, over 71, which is the fat when the shear stress is zero, and that would give us a SIF of 1.41. If the shear stress is greater than 0.6 times the nominal stress, so if the shear stress due to a clip or a lug or friction, if this shear stress is greater than 0.6 times this nominal stress due to forces and moments, then we use the fat of 36. And in that case, our stress intensification factor would be 2.78. So this is the approach that we're going to use to develop stress intensification factors from fat diagrams. The nice thing about the IIW fat diagram is that it's been in place for a long time. It was developed by the uh, structural code principally been adopted by the uh, pressure vessel and piping industry overseas uh, quite extensively. It's based uh, on a, a large number of additional tests on these, these uh, fatigue components. And it gives us a large number of geometries to choose, choose from. Here's, a number, here's another fat that could be used for a pipe support plate. Here's a fat for contoured plates. 
Here are fats that we could use to get guidance for repads and wear plates. Key parameter here being to check the notes so that we can see when the particular fat is applicable. Here are fats for plates that are uh, end plates that would be perpendicular to the uh, bending load. Here are fats for, for support pins or uh, small uh, attachments. And here is a fat for a load through a plate that's attached to the pipe. This would uh, not typically be used in a pipe support, but I included this figure because I thought it was interesting. There's a lot of, of good data that uh, can be uh, obtained and used from IIW type uh, cartoon methods for fatigue design. So let's draw some conclusions about this simple method for developing SIFs. Step one is we find an applicable cartoon uh, or cartoons that can describe the support components that we have. Next, we read carefully the rules for each cartoon and decide how each should apply and what load or what fat should be used for each. We select the most conservative, where the most conservative is the support plate or weldment that gives the lowest fat. And then that fat is ratioed to the fat for the girth bolt weld, which we're taking as 100 and the result is an SIF. That SIF should be used in Caesar or auto pipe or K-pipe or any pipe stress program at the head of each of the at the end of each of the header elements framing into the support for systems subject to fatigue moment loadings in the piping system. Now let's talk about the base case. For the base case what we want to do is replicate a stress intensification factor test, and we want to replicate it with FEA. The stress intensification factor test looks like this. We mount the component to a fixed load platen. We apply a cyclic load and wait until it fails. So how might we simulate this test with an FEA analysis or for a structural component? For a structural component, what we do is we take the same pipe, attach the support to it, mount the support rigidly to the platen, and apply the load through the load ramp. This diagram uh, tries to, to simplify that, that um, uh, poor, uh, poor uh, uh, modified photograph. One of the keys to the SIF test is that all the load goes through the support. The opposing end is free. We would do this for the out-of-plane direction. We would do this for the in-plane direction and potentially develop the two different stress intensification factors. The key thing to note in terms of, of difference in loading is that the stress intensification factor load or the stress intensification factor geometry says apply the load to one end, fix either other end and compute the stress intensification factor. So for our supports, we could fix the pipe end and allow the support end to be free, or we could fix the support end and allow the pipe end to be free. In general, this will be the more conservative, but sometimes it is reflective of a bad design because of excessively high loads that are placed through the pipe into the support. This tends to be what is more typical because our loads don't, or at our supports, we generally don't contain very, very high bending moments or exceptionally high bending moments that aren't covered by the support spec. So in this case, and in general, the simple approach that we just talked about will be adequate. But what we would like to do is now look at this case and see if it agrees to the stress intensification factors, to the, the order of magnitude of stress intensification factor that we saw with the simple case. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a simple model, we're going to free one end, the pipe end, we're going to fix the other pipe end, and we're going to apply our load 100% through our support. I'm going to use a 24 inch standard wall pipe, I'm going to use an extra long shoe length of 15 inches, and a web plate of half inch. To compute the stress intensification factor, I'm going to compute the alternating peak stress and divide it by the nominal stress in the pipe due to the moment on the pipe shoe. Because the moment on the pipe shoe, with one end free, 
has to also be the moment on my fixed end or the moment in my pipe. And this is the nominal stress that would be developed in the pipe stress program. The alternating peak stress is going to be calculated by taking an FSRF from Section 8, Division 2, multiplied by the nominal bending stress or the local bending stress computed due to the bending moment on the pipe, divide that by 2 to get to the alternating peak stress, and then divide that by the nominal stress, which is going to be M over Z, where Z is the section modulus of the pipe. We're going to do this first with WRC 107, because WRC 107 is a commonly available program. We have a WRC 107 program in FE pipe, so I'm going to pull it up, type in the dimensions of the pipe that I'm interested in, type in the load, type in the dimensions of my support, hit the calculate button, and I see that the nominal stress or the, lo the local nominal stress in the pipe is 8520 PSI. That's PL plus PB plus Q. That is the local stress at the support due to the bending moment. I can also do that in Caesar. I get the same thing. It's important to note that this is not the same as using the fat curve comparisons that we did before. This is for evaluating loads through the support. And in general, it will be for evaluating high loads through supports. Caesar, FE pipe for WRC 107, give us the same result. Next, we need to get our FSRF. We can go to Table 5.12 from Section 8, Division 2, the, the 2007 version. FSRFs are based on the inspection method. We'll pick a non-volumetric surface inspection method. Take our FSRF of 1.7. Continue on in our calculation. The PL plus PB plus Q stress from WRC 107 was 8,520 PSI. FRSF we selected was 1.7. The section modulus of the pipe was calculated to be 164 cubic inches. Here is the I equation that was presented earlier. When I plug in the applicable values, we get a stress intensification factor of 119. Now, stress intensification factor of 119 seems high. So let's check the results using a finite element program. For convenience, I'm going to use Nozzle Pro to generate the model and FE Pipe to manipulate the model, because Nozzle Pro lets me generate a finite element model by just entering these five values. Nozzle Pro builds this model for me. I move it into FE Pipe so that I can refine the mesh and apply the loads as I like. There's a free end at one end simulating the, the free pipe cap on our SIP test. We apply the bending moment to the other end, and we fix our pipe shoe to our load plan. Here's the FEA result. The calculated PL plus PV plus Q stress from the FEA result was 5,766 PSI versus WRC's 8,520 PSI. So we can adjust our SIF by the ratio of our stresses. But that only reduces the SIF to 80. That still seems very high. As an aside, I'd like to go back and take a quick look at the penetration line stresses. So we'll notice in this finite element calculation that there's no stress computed in the penetration line. This is as recommended in Section 8, Division 2, 2007. If we go back and ask the finite element program to calculate the stress at the penetration line, what we see that the number jumps is that the number jumps to 9,000 psi. And the 9,000 psi is much closer to the 8,500 psi found in WRC 107. Unfortunately, this number is at a singularity, so a refined mesh or a slightly cruder mesh will adjust this number up or down. So we can see where the WRC 107 calculation comes from. It's not that the finite element calculation made to get the 5766 is any more accurate. It's just that in this case, the finite element calculation doesn't include the peak stresses along the penetration line that the 107 calculation includes, and that we know doesn't need to be there. Even though our SIF of 80 with the stresses removed from the penetration line is probably realistic, but
it still seems too high. So now what I'd like to do is go to another method to try to validate this high stress intensification factor. There is another method that lets us calculate stresses due to external loads on lugs, and that's the nuclear code method N318. So what I did was I took the N318 cal calculation, which can be plotted, and I generated curves for a variety of nominal diameters and pipe schedules. And for each of those, develop the stress intensification factor using the SIF expression or the SIF approach that we described earlier. And what you see is that indeed very high stress intensification factors can exist for loads through supports into the pipe. What this tells us is that for certain diameters of pipe, the nominal stress in the pipe is actually quite small as the moment that produced that nominal stress develops a, a high local stress in the pipe at the support. So the stress in the pipe isn't a very good indicator of the local stress developed in the pipe due to the support. If we wanted to use a SIF based on this approach and the stress calculations we made earlier, we might select this relationship. Although I'm not so sure this, is rec this would be recommended because these tend to be high values. If you want to use them, they'll almost certainly be conservative. What we're going to recommend is that four high loads through supports, and this tends to be in conditions where loads through supports are abnormally high, individual evaluations of each support on a support-by-support -support basis should be performed. So let's try to summarize what we just talked about. Generating stress intensification factors for loads through pipes at supports is reasonable using the FAT ratios. So what we do is we take the IIW or similar cartoon method diagrams. We go through, we pull out the diagrams that are applicable to our support geometries, and we develop SIFs from the lowest FAT curve, comparing it to the girth bolt weld FAT curve of 100. Generating SIFs for high load through supports is more difficult because the bending stresses tend to produce very high local stresses. And so these should more or less or probably be evaluated on a support by support basis. Conservative SIFs through supports can certainly be generated by using the equation that we used before, but two is probably a more reasonable value. Uh, people would say, why is 2 a more reasonable value? Or how can you say that the, the fat ratios are more reasonable? Well, what we use now is 1. What most of us use now for SIFs and supports is 1, and then leave it to the support design. In situations where we can show that, indeed, the support would fail first due to loading through the pipe, and we have a fatigue condition, we almost certainly should use a, a stress intensification factor of the supports of at least 2 to try to help the support designer with his job later on. Where supports must be designed to take these large thermal loads, what we saw just now is that WRC-107 can be a pretty good approach, and it's certainly better than doing nothing. When we're evaluating these large uh, loads at supports, developed moments can be due to friction loads, guides, stops, and hard, large heavy base plates like where the base plate is large and we have a bending moment that would produce torsion about this pipe, the base plate isn't going to want to rotate freely. Our piping models put point loads at these center lines, at the center line of the pipe, and allow for free torsion. So we would develop a torsional resistance here, or a torsional moment at this support that's not seen in pipe stress programs if we don't recognize the torsional resistance due to these large base plates. When we talk about high loading through the supports, what we're talking about is load that's taken from some other point in the piping system and is carried almost entirely and is somewhat high through the support and is not carried by the rest of the system. We want to be a little bit careful with the WRC, cal <coughs> excuse me, the WRC calculations that we recommended. When we have multiple loads that are high, the WRC calculation we just saw was good when we had a single load component that was contributing the majority of our load. We only had one load component. 
when you have a circumferential moment and a longitudinal moment that are both high, the WRC calculations will vary more significantly from the finite element calculations in those cases. When we want to look at simple ways to evaluate supports, we can look at a program like Nozzle Pro that does that. There's two approaches to this. In Nozzle Pro, there is a shoe model which is designed for liquid loads, weight, and forces that cause distortion around the pipe. That is, in general, what we don't have, but that is in existence for large D over T systems. For most high-loaded pipe supports, we can get a good quick evaluation from WRC 107 or by a similar finite element analysis of a simple cross-sectional component. What we do with the simple cross-sectional component is we select the pipe shoe that best describe or the cross-section that best describes the pipe shoe. We define the forces and moments that act on that cross-section, being aware of point loads or shear loads that can produce bending moments. If we've got high single loads, we might pick running WRC 107 first because that, that'll give us probably a pretty good evaluation. And we want to be careful. I, I wanted to, to mention note four. We want to be careful when we compare our finite element or WRC 107 loads to the pipe support load specification that's based only on nominal diameters. The pipe support load specs are generally developed for standard wall pipe. So if we're using piping that is a little bit larger in diameter, that is not standard wall, that's thinner than standard wall, then our pipe support load specification may not be conservative. Some examples of this, if I've got this pipe shoe, as a simplification, I would probably use this cross section, elongated of course. For this pipe shoe, I would use just a simple lug. And for this pipe shoe, I would use a simple H cross section and apply the piping loads through the H cross section and develop my local loads through one of these models. Here's another example. So here's the moments that are developed through the pipe shoes from the pipe stress analysis. And then we apply them through these relatively simple geometries. In our piping model, we want to be conscious of cases where we may need to provide rotational restraint to simulate things like large base plates, guides, or stops. So let's go through our support checklist now. We would generally only worry about, worry about these types of things when we have cyclic loads or cyclic pressure. But in these cases, this is very important. Stresses due to local loading will in general be proportional to R over T to the 2 thirds, where R is the mean radius of the pipe. Larger D over T pipe loads produce, tend to produce higher stresses. And those are higher proportional stresses with respect to the bending moments in the pipe. So that's where we need to be more, uh, more careful. And that's what we saw from the uh, exaggerated SIF diagrams before. The B31 codes explicitly tell us to evaluate friction loads that can produce moments. We've seen that those moments can produce very high stresses for large D over T systems. And the, the B31 code ex explicitly tells us to look at the local stresses and bending moments due to those loads. B31.3 additionally mentions flattening and thermal gradient. When we're looking to do a, uh, an evaluation and apply engineering judgment, we look to see if the large loads are applied through the pipe that go on into the pipe or through the pipe into the support. Where they go through the pipe into the support, we want to be a little more cautious about them. And even low stresses in the pipe may not be indicative of high stresses at the support. We need to develop the, we need to be cautious of the fatigue problem and develop the level of analysis required. If the risk of failure is very, very high, then we don't want to use even any of the simple finite element methods developed here. And we want to build very sophisticated brick models with weld models and all these other things, as we'll talk about a little bit later. In most situations, we don't need to worry about those things. In fact, in most situations, we don't do this at all. But in some situations, particularly with high cyclic loads, we definitely have failures at support. We note that our inspection method has an effect on our FSRF, and our FSRF has a effect, direct effect on our stress. This is something that we, in general, didn't do before, 
but the Section 8, the Division 2 2000 code lets us do that. So we want to be aware that the inspection method can have an effect on the allowable load bearing at our support. Check, uh, quick checks of rectangular shapes using WRC 107, as we're going to see later, and we've already seen, can give very good guidance for evaluating these loadings. I put a few pictures in here to emphasize that all loads should be evaluated. This was a SIF test that we started here at PRG. We were surprised to find that, that quite small axial loads produced a plastic deformation at the, the saddle horn. These are deformations in a vessel due to cryogenic liquid fill. And with the cryogenic liquid halfway in the vessel, the bottom portion of the vessel contracts, causing significant thermal bowing of the vessel. In this case, the support was bolted onto the vessel and the thermal expansion of the stainless steel wasn't considered as the line expanded and the support did not, being of a larger thermal mass. This is a, uh, a thermal gradient problem that the code talks about. And in this case, the, the bolts were completely sheared off. In this case, load due to water hammer bent the support over. All loads must be evaluated. So the stress engineer needs to talk to the process engineer and decide if there are potentially water hammer loads that could develop in the piping system. I'd like to talk now for a, uh, for a minute just about saddles as pipe or vessel supports. Saddles are predominantly designed by ZIC. ZIC is not intended for axial or lateral loads, although we uh, tend to fudge ZIC to get it to uh, apply to uh, uh, large axial or lateral loads. ZIC for piping tends to be a little bit more problematic because we oftentimes won't use the number of stiffening rings that the, the vessel engineer would use. Ovalization in large D over T systems can contribute significantly to high local bending stresses at supports. Where you're concerned about that, either do an analysis or use full encirclement saddles because those definitely help, uh, in fact, most times uh, eliminate high stresses at the horns of saddles that can be developed. Again, these are rules that are far, far more significant when the system cycles. If the system doesn't cycle, then the high local loads uh, tend not to be a concern. Ovalization is not considered in six degree of freedom beam analyses, so K factors for bends, where that is used for ovalization, K factors can be used for intersections, which do and, uh, add some contribution due to ovalization, but there is no K factor for saddles in pipe systems that include the effect of this ovalization. <clears throat> Talk just for a second about stress tens at saddles due to size or static weight loads. <clears throat> Here's a distribution of what the stresses look like. This is the high bending and uh, membrane stresses that develop at the horn of the saddle. <clears throat> Here's an example of the ovalization that can be, be developed around the saddle supported large D over T vessel. Now we'd like to talk just a, a brief moment about wear plates. Wear plates can be used and are often reduced, used to reduce stresses in the shell, but very thin wear plates can be overstressed, and very thick wear plates may force uh, excessive stresses into the surrounding shell. So there are recommended ratios for finding optimal wear plate thicknesses for weight loads, and there are op optimal ratios for external loads. This is the influence of pad thicknesses for external loads. When the T over T ratio, thickness of the pad to thickness of the vessel, is between 1.4 and 0.4, the stress in the vessel is not strongly influenced by the T over T ratio. <clears throat> As the thickness of the pad increases, the thickness of the, the stress in the vessel begins to go up. As the T over T ratio is less than 1.4, the high stress tends to be in the pad. <clears throat> Here is an example of the distribution in stresses as we move from a, a very thin pad with a T over T ratio of less than 1 to a very thick pad where the T over T ratio is greater than 1. And here you can see how the high stress is moved into the vessel. With a thin pad, the high stress is moved into the pad and then into the saddle plate. Bends, of course, can have uh, pipe supports and structural attachments. 
We definitely prefer pipe attachments to bends rather than structural attachments. Structural attachments to bends tend to uh, uh, form what are essentially can openers on the bend and produce local stresses. They are preferred today because an inspector can get in among the, the web and the flange and inspect the bend for thinning, which uh, is difficult, if not impossible, to do when pipe attachments are used. So we're moving from evenly distributed loads and uh, lower stresses to high concentrated stresses for the sake of inspection. BenPro, a product uh, to be released uh, in the next month or so by Pollen Research Group, allows the analysis of uh, pipe supports or structural supports directly. It is interesting because if I take the 14 inch standard wall pipe and a standard radius bend and apply our 15 inch long pipe shoe to the bend radius and apply the 10,000 inch pound moment that we used previously in the example for our pipe, we see that our finite element model for the cylinder gave 5,700 PSI and for the bend gave 4,800 PSI. We also recall that the WRC model, the WRC 107 model, gave us fairly good stresses for this junction. So what we're, our conclusion is that WRC 107 can be reasonable for getting at least an approximation of lug loads on large D over T pipe connections, including connections on bends. And that is certainly better than doing nothing at all. Let's talk just a second about interaction distances, because we're always, always asked about interaction distances. How close can supports be placed with respect to each other or with respect to intersections? There are two things. There are two controlling factors for interaction distances. One is ovalization due to bends, which tends to uniformly ovalize the pipe cross section. There can be ovalization through trunnions or pipe intersections. Large uh, uniform ovalization tends to occur when trunnions are large or where the intersection D over D ratio is large. Large pipe attachments, large structural attachments, saddles will also produce uniform ovalization when the attachment is large with respect to the pipe diameter. There are also point loads at bends that produce concentrated loads, and there are concentrated interaction distances. Here are the equations that we recommend for interaction distances. This L critical is the length from the edge of the initiation of the localization to the point at the end of the influence of the localization. And if you have something within this interaction distance, the degree of influence can be conservatively estimated by doing a linear interpolation. So what we see is that the interaction distance is a function of the, the radius of the pipe and in the denominator, the thickness of the pipe, i.e. the D over T ratio, as we would expect. Point loads have a longer interaction distance than uniform ovalization by about two times, by exactly two times. Very comprehensive FEA models can be constructed if needed. These are a number of models that were con constructed at Pollen Research Group by Mr. Patrick Marcotte. And so these simple methods that we've discussed are certainly better than doing nothing at all. But if needed, very comprehensive models can be built. So in conclusion, we like to say that lightly or normally loaded supports can be evaluated for fatigue loads. We would only go to this trouble when we have fatigue loads on the piping system by using fat ratios based on the geometries of our support, what we called in the presentation as the simple method. This is definitely better than doing nothing at all. Sits for external loads that are on the high side that are carried wholly by the pipe shoe should be evaluated on a support by support basis. And what we saw is the WRC-107 or Nozzle Pro, the simple models through Nozzle Pro, can be fast, effective tools for evaluating these support cross-sections. It is very important to evaluate the loads properly and to properly develop all of the moments that exist at a pipe support. The codes tell us that we also need to include thermal gradients, all direct forces, and flattening. 
We have looked at methods for developing interaction distances, so we know how far our supports should be from intersections or other discontinuities on the pipe so that the two uh, effects don't interact. We looked at for large supports with saddles that wear plates can induce other dimensional considerations, and so we should look at those considerations or use the support standards when we're selecting and sizing saddles for, for piping supports. We want to be especially careful with FEA models and boundary conditions. We don't want to induce heteronominal stresses at intersections due to point boundary conditions at ends of the model that significantly exceed those in the pipe stress analysis. What that means is that when we take loads from our beam analysis and put it on our pipe support and then apply that load to the finite element model, we want to make sure that the M over Z stress at the pipe support in the pipe is not greater than the M over Z, Z stress in the pipe in the beam analysis. That's, uh, that's a little bit confusing, but when you start doing the finite element models, note H should probably be circled because people tend to move boundary conditions further and further and further away and in doing so induce larger and larger more artificial moments at the support that don't really exist. So that's something to just, just please keep in the back of your mind. Additionally, load ratings that have been Xerox 15 times and that based on old, old calculations that aren't developed using D over T, because the majority aren't, based on nominal wall, may not be conservative for uh, cases where you have thinner than nominal wall pipe. Please also note that uh, friction loads can induce large bending stresses and that it's the bending stresses it supports that can cause some of the highest stresses, certainly in the thin wall, large diameter piping systems.